Well, this morning as part of our message, we're going to actually look at some of the different names that were given to the Messiah. And, you know, we hear the name Jesus and Christ, and some people think Christ is his last name, and it's not. Um, but what does it mean, and do these names really matter? There are names that we have of Jesus throughout Scripture. There's also titles. And as I was kind of looking into the different names and titles, there's a lot. So we will not cover them all today, unless you want to stay for four hours. Any takers? Okay, a couple of you. Excellent. Uh, you get extra credit. But the name of Christ, the name of Jesus, is an important thing. Um, and it, because it tells us who he is, and it gives us a broader picture of what it means to have him as our Lord and Savior. Philippians 2, 5 through, uh, well, 7, 5 through 9 actually, in total, have this mind of humility among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Now that's an interesting verse because it talks about his name and the idea of confessing his name. It's not just saying his name, it's acknowledging who he said he was. Jesus claimed many times to be God, God in the flesh, Emmanuel. And because he made that claim, it set him apart from any other individual that claimed to be a Messiah. There were other individuals, other men that said, oh yeah, I'm the Messiah that you guys have been waiting for. And because they couldn't prove it, they were killed. Now, you might say, well, isn't that what happened to Jesus? Well, a little bit different because those other individuals never came back to life. Whereas today we celebrate that Jesus Christ is alive, that on the cross he had victory over our sin, and in the grave he had victory over death. And because he had victory over sin and death, we can be partakers of that as well. So before we move on and looking at some of these names of Jesus, some of the names of the Messiah, uh, let's have a moment of prayer. <clears throat> Our gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you today so humbled that you don't need us for your plan to move forward, but you want us. And you're not looking for perfect people. None of us here this morning are perfect. In fact, you've reminded us in your word that all have sinned and fallen short of your glory. Lord, you've also reminded us that you being perfect cannot have anything to do with imperfection. And we are very imperfect. And so the price had to be paid for our sin. That sin had to be removed and we just can't be good enough. We can try, we can strive, we can work as hard as we possibly can, and yet it's not good enough because we're still going to fail, we're still going to stumble. And so, Lord, we are here this morning thankful and grateful and humbled that you sent your only Son, Jesus Christ, to become one of us, to live among us, and to take upon that penalty which he didn't know we did, but that we couldn't pay. Thank you, Lord, for Jesus Christ, and it's in his name we ask these things. Amen. Well, any guesses as to the most common name for Jesus in the Bible? Jesus. All right, good. Uh, <laughs> so uh, Jesus is kind of the English form, if you will, and, um, you know, there's a little Latin that messed things up, and we can blame the Germans for most of the world's problems. Again, Pastor Darren Krause. Uh, <laughs> so it is the most common name by far in scripture uh, that is used for him. And uh, it comes from, uh, well, the Greek, which is Jesus, which means salvation. 
And that actually, the Greek is based on the Hebrew, Yeshua, uh, and, uh, or Yasha, uh, which means to save. And it's the root for the name Joshua, Hosea, and Isaiah, the same root there. It emphasizes his humanity um, and the work he came to do. So, very common name, misused many times. Uh, some people use it as a swear word. Can I just remind you of the Ten Commandments and recommend that you not do that? Um, now, probably the second most commonly used name would be Christ. Christ is a Greek word, Christos, um, and it's based on the Hebrew, uh, which means anointed or anointed one. In other words, he was the one chosen. And it's not just a name, it's also a title. And so it really, when you see Jesus Christ, it should probably be translated Jesus the Christ. It's not just any anointed one, it's the anointed one for a specific purpose. And that specific purpose was us, to pay that penalty of sin that we owe. It emphasizes the office of Messiah, uh, that he was deserving of it and the only one that was worthy of it. You know, there's still people in, around the world that claim to be Jesus Christ in the flesh. And um, in fact, there's a guy right now, and I don't recall which country, and it's probably not important, but uh, one of these guys who he was proclaiming to his village that he was the, the Messiah, that he's Jesus Christ. And they seriously, the villagers got together and said, great, we're gonna crucify you this Friday, Good Friday, and we'll see you on Sunday. <laughs> he changed his tone. He no longer claimed to be Jesus. Now, we should not be claiming to be Jesus, but we should be claiming to be Jesus followers, followers of Jesus Christ. Kyle Eidelman wrote a book several years ago called Not a Fan, and I love the point that he makes because he said, Jesus didn't call fans, he called us to be followers. Because a fan can be fair weather when things are going well, Seattle Mariners, Seattle Seahawks, any Seattle sports team, then it's amazing how the stadiums are sold out. And now there's people like Emmanuel, he's gonna go to a Mariners game, he doesn't care. He just wants to see the love of the game, right? Um, and this guy has actually met many of the players. I'm sort of envious. Um, they all know who he is, do they? No, okay. One day, his name will be called at uh, T-Mobile, and um, what's your number going to be? Six. Wouldn't be my first choice, but um, <laughs> as long as it's one six, I think we're okay. Uh, <laughs> Anyway, uh, but you know, there's, it's one thing to be a fan and it's to, like you can know about uh, the players and, and have that kind of, you know, oh, well I know their stats and I know all those kinds of things, stuff you can see on a baseball card or whatever it happens to be. But a follower is very different. A follower means you've actually met the person, you know the person and you continue to want to know the person and that's the way it is with Jesus Christ. But there's a whole lot of people out there that are just fans of Jesus. They like it when things go well, but they're not such a fan when things don't go well in life. So Christos, um, he is the anointed one. There's a few implications to this title that he has here, that he was appointed, and you can look at these scriptures, and, and by the way, I mention this often, but I'm not offended if you take a picture uh, of the PowerPoints, I'll try to leave them up there. Um, or if I'm really nice, I can send you uh, the notes on this uh, later. So I would take a picture. Um, so Acts 2.36 points out that he is appointed and there's this unique relationship between God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. Out of the, member of the members of the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, who does the anointing throughout Scripture? It's the Holy Spirit. And so really you're, you involve the entire Trinity when you talk about Jesus Christ, the Son, because he's anointed, and who does the anointing? The Holy Spirit. And, uh, and then of course God is the one who appointed him. We see that uh, the, the Holy Spirit aspect in Acts 4.27 and Acts 10.38. Now this is another word that you're probably familiar with, logos, and it means simply the word. Now, we could go into a really interesting study of, of the individual who kind of figured out that 
this word meant what it did, but the implications, and we can see this in John chapter one. These are probably some of the easiest. This would be fun if I actually looked at my notes. Uh, we can see in John chapter one, and, and these are familiar passages, I would think, to, to, to many, because it's another one of those in the beginning passages. So, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. So that's verses 1 through 3. And so, what's translated as Word is that Greek word, logos. There are some really important implications, and by the way, verse 14, if people are thinking, well, I don't know if the Word really means Jesus or not, maybe it's talking about God's Word. It could be that. Uh, but verse 14 removes any doubt. Verse 14 says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. And so the implications here, we, there's five implications. First of all, it speaks to his pre-existence, that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, existed before everything. Now, the only way you can exist before everything is if you are God, because God is the only one who has always been. And so it's, it adds to Jesus' claim that he is indeed God. And then we see in verse 1 that he is with God, that he is God, that, as we mentioned, he became flesh. Verse 18, John chapter 1 says, No one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side, who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. And so we can't see God the Father. Um, the closest anybody probably really has gotten to that was Moses. Remember when he's receiving the Ten Commandments, God says, yeah, you can't look at me, but I'll, I'll just show you a little teeny tiny part of me, a little bit of my glory. Um, and when Moses came down with the Ten Commandments, uh, it, Scripture says that he kind of was glowing um, because of that glory. It wasn't his glory. So we can't look at the Father. We would die because he's pure and he's holy and we are not. Um, and so Jesus Christ is the revealer of God. He's the representative of God the Father to all of humanity. Now, another familiar name that is given him is begotten. Um, now, we're going to have three begottens here. We're going to have begotten, only begotten, and the third one is the first begotten. And you might think, well, that seems a little bit confusing. Well, good. All right. My work is done. Um, the name begotten is used in reference to the Messiah in the context of his virgin birth. And so that's the emphasis, virgin birth by the power of the Holy Spirit. And we can see that in Luke 135. Now, only begotten, that one we should be a little bit more familiar with. Probably one of the best known verses in the Bible, John 3:16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Some have confused that thinking, oh, well, then that means that God, that Jesus was born. And if Jesus was born, he can't possibly be God. But that's not what the term means. So when we look in the Greek, uh, some of you thought, man, I really want to learn Greek on Sunday morning. Well, here you go. Um, so we've got a couple of really important Greek words. This uh, one that you see there is monogenesa, anis, excuse me, <laughs> Managanase. There we go. Maganes. Maganes. I wrote it out phonetically here and I still can't read it. There it is. Uh, anyway, um, what it does is it emphasizes his eternal relationship with God the Father and his uniqueness, and that he's a son for all eternity versus a born son. The word begotten can be used for other individuals. For example, Adam is called a son of God. When we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, we are called sons and daughters of God. And so because he's called son, there's a big difference though, is that we're called sons and daughters, but we die. 
and we do not raise ourselves from the dead. Jesus Christ, on the other hand, did die and raised himself from the dead. So he's a son for all eternity. He's always been the son. We become a son or a daughter at the point that we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. We have the first begotten. We see that in Colossians 1, 15 and 18. Also in Hebrews, the entire first chapter. And another fancy Greek word, which is protohakos. Proto yes, I had these all. Prototokos. Prototokos, there we go. Yeah, you try reading this stuff. <laughs> I really, I did, I practiced these out loud yesterday, and uh, so. Um, so this particular word, the implications are that all things were created through him, that he has always existed, he's the cause of all things, and he's preeminent, meaning he is before all things in the sense of he is superior, he is supreme. And so when we read in the book of Colossians uh, chapter 1, Verse 15, he, Jesus Christ, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be, in pre, might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile all, to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And that last part, I think, is important to note because, you know, we have a cross up on the wall, and it's a symbol. We don't worship the cross, but what we do worship is the one who was on the cross and what that cross represents. Every covenant or agreement that God made with humanity in Scripture required a blood sacrifice, and you see these throughout, uh, throughout the Bible. And the ultimate covenant, the ultimate agreement between God and humanity was, I'm going to give you everlasting life, and I'm not going to require uh, separation from me because of your sin. My son has taken your place, and you can have everlasting life through that. And so it was his blood that was shed to make that agreement, to make that sacrifice. The, there's also a few, on the first begotten, there's a few concepts of being the firstborn. And we, we see that in scripture, how he's called that, the firstborn. So one is that he's, as we already mentioned, he's the firstborn of all creation. He has always existed. He's before all things. He's also in a very, you know, practical sense, he's Mary's firstborn, the first child. Um, the Bible teaches that uh, Mary, uh, uh, Jesus was Mary's first. Uh, child, and then there's six others that we know of. There's four brothers, half brothers, that are named. We know two of them for sure. Uh, well, wrote there's uh, books that they wrote in the Bible, so that would be Jude and James. Um, the other two, we have their names, but we don't have any books that they wrote. And then we know that there were at least two two daughters that Mary had. Why do we know that? Because it says she had daughters. So that's the plural, so at least two, probably more. Um, so these would have been Jesus's uh, half siblings, if you will. Um, so that he's the firstborn of Mary, and then he's the firstborn of resurrection. And that seems maybe like an odd title, but there's really two types of resurrection that are spoken of in scripture, because there's other individuals who came back to life. Um, but when they came back to life, like Lazarus, for example, he was brought back to life, but what did he eventually do? Died. Um, Jesus came back to life, and what did he eventually do? Well, there's no eventuality. <laughs> He's alive today, seated at the right hand of the Father. So he came back to life and continues to live. Kurios, um, that is one of the other terms, and we see that translated as Lord. It's one of the words translated Lord in Scripture. It's a respectful 
title when it's used, and it could be used for God or for man. So when it says, you know, uh, my Lord kind of thing, you know, it could be used for an individual. Not really something we use in our culture, but uh, if you watch PBS, you've probably heard it somewhere. Um, but you, you're all righteous people, so you don't watch PBS. No, I watch PBS. How many people say they watch PBS because they just want to impress people? Okay, thank you, Teresa, for your honesty. Dumb nabby. Um, number two, it can be used of ownership, like Lord of the Manor or the Lord of these lands or things like that. And that title can be used of God and man. But the third one, the third usage is for, is deity. And yeah, that one's only God. Only God can claim that particular uh, title. And you can see there's multiple scriptures that use the term Lord uh, for that. So, kurios. And then one in, uh, based, a similar word in the, uh, to the Greek, but in the Hebrew is Adonai. And Adonai, we can see that in Psalm 110, verse 1, which I will read here. So Psalm 110, 1, a Psalm of David, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Now just reading it, it might sound a little confusing. It says Lord twice, but the first Lord is uh, Yahweh, which we'll get to that one in just a bit. Um, then the second Lord is Adonai. So it's saying the Lord, Yahweh, says to my Lord, Adonai, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Um, it's the plural of of Adon. Adon can be used for mankind, but uh, only Adonai is used for the Lord. And it has the idea of him being Lord, Master, Owner. We belong to him. Theos is the word that's used, uh, translated as God in John 1.1, 1, 1, which we uh, referenced earlier. Elohim Elohim is the first introduction to God that we have, Genesis chapter 1, 1. In the beginning, God, Elohim, created the heavens and the earth. And Elohim is an odd little quirky word because um, it can be a, it's sort of a singular plural or a plural singular. And so right off the bat, we get kind of a, a, a whisper, if you will, of the Trinity, of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, uh, Old Testament to New Testament application, if you look at Isaiah 4.3, compare it with Luke 3.4, and then Psalm 45.6 with Hebrews 1.8, you'll see how the word is used in the Old Testament to speak of God, and it's used in the New Testament to speak of Jesus Christ, adding further validity to his claim that he is indeed God. And then here's the name that we probably also know very, very well, and that's Yahweh. Um, some translations, some groups use the term Jehovah. Sorry, Germans, but that's a lousy German translation of Yahweh. We don't really know how to pronounce Yahweh. You can see in the Hebrew, transliteration is Y-H-V-H. -H. Uh, we call that the tetragrammaton. There's a fancy word you can impress your friends with. Um, but the Jews so revered the name of God, they were so in awe of who he was that they didn't speak the name. So we don't know how ex exactly how it was pronounced. Um, in fact, uh, some of you might have seen fragments of the Dead Sea Scrolls years ago when they were at the Pacific Science Center. And uh, in some of those copies, whenever it mentioned God, they would use a different font and even a different color uh, because they didn't want it to be the same. They wanted to show reverence for it and respect uh, for his name. So it's God's personal name, if you will. And you can see there are, there are quotes in the New Testament from the Old Testament. In fact, let's go ahead and, and take one of those. Just for an example, we'll take the first one. So Ephesians 4, 8 through 10. Ephesians 4, 8 through 10. Therefore it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of, cap of captives, and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower regions, the earth? 
He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens that he might fulfill all things. So if we go back to Psalm 68, 18, it reads, when you ascended on high, leading a host of captives in your train and receiving gifts among men, even among the rebellious, that the Lord God may dwell there. So you can see how Paul, writing to the church in Ephesus, quotes uh, that passage from Psalm 68, 18. Now, why does it matter? Well, again, it lends further proof to the fact that Jesus is God. Um, these New Testament authors are using names and quotes that are from the Old Testament that say that he is God. So they're using the same, the same terms. A couple of other, pa of other passages, if you want to look them up, uh, you can see them there on the screen. Well, as I said earlier, there are far more names and titles of the Messiah that we could get into, but I hope you see kind of a common theme with all of them in that they, they speak to who he is and give us a broader sense of who our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is. And so on this Resurrection Sunday, it really is about new life. It's about life to death, excuse me, death to life. Um, because our sin is abhorrent, which is the strongest word of hatred that we see in Scripture. And the abhorrence is because it's, it's an offense to God. As I mentioned earlier, God is perfect, and because he's perfect, he can't have anything to do with something that is unholy or imperfect. And so when we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, it does not make us perfect. What it does is it removes that eternal consequence of sin. It also gives us God's Holy Spirit so that we can make it through the day and not completely lose our minds. God's Holy Spirit gives us insight, gives us strength, uh, help us, helps us uh, to use discernment in knowing what's right and what is wrong. And... Uh, the symbol of death, though, is that when we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, then we are dead to sin. Before we come to Christ, sin rules us. It's the one that calls the shots. And when it calls the shots, bad things happen. <laughs> um, now, when we come to Jesus Christ, when we accept him as our Savior, it does not mean that we lose the desire to sin, because we have a sin nature. Sometimes the Bible calls it the flesh or the old man, and that, that sin nature is always present. It is always with us. And so our desire is to not serve God, not do the right thing. But as Christians, we can confess our sin, and that's a beautiful thing. Uh, 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So that sin is then no longer a hindrance. It's, it's out of the way and we can move forward and serve him. So on this Resurrection Sunday, uh, or as most in the, many in the world know it as Easter, and we don't call it Easter for a number of reasons, but um, the name has its roots in weird stuff. Um, it's okay if you call it Easter. Nobody's going to be offended here um, if you call it that. But we refer to it as Resurrection Sunday because it is about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is about the fact that when those individuals went to the tomb, he was not there. They had seen him brutally tortured and nailed to a cross, and, uh, you know, they watched him die and put him in a tomb, and uh, many of them lost hope at that point. And yet he had told them that he would raise from the dead. He told them that he would have victory over death, and that's exactly what he did. Because if Jesus died on the cross, and that was it, that was the end of the story, we'd be hopeless. But because he rose from the dead, because he had victory over sin and death, we have hope. We have great hope in Jesus Christ. 